and we're live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome back to our e-seminar series uh, on translational biomedical engineering. I'm very pleased and excited to uh, to host uh, Dr. Michael Callis uh, from University of Calgary, uh, who will talk about bioprocess engineering for cell therapy manufacturing today. But before we start, uh, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please write um, uh, the questions in the Q&A box uh, so we can uh, uh, keep track of uh, the questions and make sure that we, uh, we pass them to the speaker. Also, uh, please uh, participate uh, uh, in, in the poll uh, uh, and provide your feedback to this a seminar series. Um, of course, uh, you, you can always send, uh, send me and uh, Human an email and share your thoughts about these e seminar series with us. So uh, uh, I have. Uh, I also would like to uh, share some good news that we have. Uh, we have a line of uh, fantastic speakers coming up uh, for the next few weeks. Um, so make sure that you follow us on Twitter uh, 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 and then also uh, on the LinkedIn. Uh, our next speaker is Professor uh, Annabi from uh, UCLA. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then she will be uh, uh, the next guest speaker for us. But, uh, and then uh, uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, thank uh, Montreal Transmed Tech uh, uh, Institute, who has been with us for uh, almost since almost the beginning of DC seminar series. And then they've been uh supporting uh, this initiative uh, uh for almost a year now uh, thank you montreal transmit tech institute so with that uh, it's my great pleasure to invite uh, dr callus uh, uh to this uh to this uh to present his work uh dr callus is a professor in the department of chemical and petroleum engineering at the uh, Schulich uh, school of engineering uh, he is also an adjunct uh, in the Department of Cell Biology and Anatomy in the Cummings School of uh, uh, Medicine and the Associate Director of uh, Pharmaceutical Production Research Facility at the University of uh, Calgary. He is the Director of Biomedical Engineering Calgary Initiative, Associate Director of the Center for uh, Bioengineering Research and Education, as well as a member of the uh, McKeg Institute for Bone and Joint Health. Uh, he is a professional engineer registered with APEC Alberta, uh, uh, a chemical engineer by training. He performs research in stem cell bioprocess engineering, a key element in the clinical implementation of regenerative medicine and cell therapies. His research includes working with mouse, um, with human cells, uh, including embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and so on and so forth. Uh, his research is based on a strong foundation in mass transfer, reactor design, uh, reaction, kinetics, fluid dynamics, and uh, experience in both experimental and modeling approaches. As a director of uh, Biomedical Engineering uh, Calgary Initiative and the engineering uh, uh, solutions for health research strategy at the University of Calgary. He has brought together over 300 researchers from multiple faculties across campus to tackle problems in human and animal health and wellness. The University of Calgary has a critical mass of researchers working on human mobility, advanced biomedical imaging, regenerative medicine, uh, precision biodiagnostics, health monitoring and management, and novel medical uh, technologies. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Carlos to, uh, uh, to uh, share his screen, which he has done. And then now the uh, virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And I didn't know you'd read the whole introduction. I would have written a shorter one for you, <laughs> but it was uh, very nice. Um, so thanks again for inviting me. Uh, as Mosin mentioned, I'm gonna talk about bioprocess engineering. Our focus is on cell manufacturing for cell therapy, and really we're talking about scaling up cell production. And hopefully my slides will flip through. There we go. 
So I've broken the talk up into four main parts. The first is really uh, an introduction to uh, why we need manufacturing, a little bit about bioreactors and bioprocessing to provide some background and context. Um, I'm next going to talk about our, our kind of baseline work with mouse embryonic stem cells and stirred suspension bioreactors, so spinner flasks and horizontal blade bioreactors. And then I'm going to move on and talk a little bit more about an industry partnership that we've developed with PBS Biotech and their vertical wheel bioreactors and how we've uh, really come to like them for induced pluripotent stem cell um, expansion. And then finally talk a bit about removing some of the bioprocessing bottlenecks that exist um, in, in kind of moving from static culture to bioreactors. So we'll start with a little bit about uh, cell therapy, a little bit about manufacturing. Um, and I guess the first question is why, why do we need manufacturing? Um, and I think that uh, if you follow the news and if you're following what's happening in medicine, uh, you'll have heard about gene therapy, you'll hear, heard about cell therapy, probably CAR T cells, uh, stem cells, regenerative medicine. Um, all of those terms um, really need um, a large source of cells. And so you can see that there's lots of numbers here and every year I go and update them, billions of dollars and in increases in, in the market for these, as well as the number of clinical trials in the top right there. Um, just showing that this is steadily increasing and, and these are being investigated now. It's not something uh, too far in the future. And the market specifically for regenerative medicine is, is seen to be um, having quite an increase in the next few years. Um, and if you go and look at clinicaltrials.gov, which I do every time I teach a course on this, and I did a couple of days ago, these are the current clinical trials. Um, just if you do a search on the word stem cells, you can see a large number in the US here. Um, Europe, um, China, quite a few. Uh, this number is down in COVID. I think it was about 7,000 total uh, a couple of years ago. Now it's 5,000. I think people are focusing more on COVID strategies, but I expect that to kind of go back up once we have hopefully get out of the woods here for COVID. But again, this shows that um, this technology is here now and the demand is here now. And so why do we care about manufacturing? Well, if we look at... Um, say a cell dose of 10 to the eight cells per kilogram, and you've got a, a smaller patient, a child, you probably grow those cells in about 10 tea flasks with about 100 mils of media each. But if you're looking at an adult, so five times the mass, now you've got 50 tea flasks. And if you think of each tea flask having to be opened and closed, um, monitoring of conditions in that tea flask is gonna be difficult. And you're actually gonna get different things happening in all those flasks. One of those, um, I mean, 50 T flasks here can be replaced by one five liter bioreactor um, where you have all the cells seeing relatively the same conditions. You get process monitoring and control. So the, the message here from this slide is that the cell therapies will require large numbers of cells. And if we look at bioreactor systems as well as automation, um, it can increase reducibility, increase reliability and actually lower costs because you're not gonna be wasting as many cells. And so there are two main types of manufacturing that we think about when we think about cell therapies. The first is an allogeneic type therapy where we can think of it as a universal donor. So one person donates cells and you can treat a lot of patients. And the other is autologous or patient specific um, where each person would donate their own cells to be manipulated and then transplanted back into that person. So if we go back to allogeneic, the strategy is scale up. So we're talking about large lot sizes and bigger bioreactors. You would have a master and a working cell bank. You would also need a, a lot of infrastructure. So you need a lot of larger bioreactors and larger systems to, to support those. Obviously a lot of process control in both of them. Um, and it's a high risk. If you lose 500 liters worth of cells, uh, you're gonna cry a lot and you're gonna lose a lot of money for your company. Um, so batch failure is, is really risky there. And you also have to think about production and distribution. So you can't have these types of facilities everywhere. You would need them at kind of centralized locations. And then depending on whether your cell therapy could be distributed frozen or had to be fresh, and there's a time limit, you, you then have a, a distance or a window of kind of locations and you have to maybe bring the patients to the manufacturing or have a way to distribute those cells. If we're looking at patient specific and some therapies will require something like this, this is more scale out. So we have lots and lots of smaller batches of cells that we're manufacturing. Here, we're talking about really precious starting material. So you might only have one shot to get cells from a patient. 
uh, generate something that they need and transplant them back before something worse happens with the patient or uh, you don't have that many cells to even start with. Um, there's also gonna be patient heterogeneity. So as an engineer, you have to think about how you can generate a process. So each of these little bioreactors that takes cells from different people, but allows you to have a reproducible and stable product that comes out each, each time. So lots of testing um, are involved there in order to make sure that you have the right type of cells and you're not doing anything damaging to them. And so again, this lends itself a lot to automation and really massively parallel operations. And here you could imagine uh, a number of these either at a central facility with a number of small bioreactors or you could imagine um, smaller facilities in, in kind of larger hospitals, for example, that could be um, set up with enough automation to run these things. So two kinds of different bioreactors and processes, really big bioreactors here, um, really small ones, but really you know precise process control. And so this is the classic slide. If I don't present this, my lab gets cranky, um, uh, where we talk about the difference really between static and bioreactor. And I mentioned this a little bit, there's variability between all of these flasks. It's very labor intensive. It's very hard to control and monitor. Um, very hard to do kind of perfusion operation, for example. So uh, really you can operate in batch mode. Whereas with a bioreactor, you can then scale to different sizes depending how many you need. A lot less labor intensive, a lot more process control and monitoring lends itself a lot more to kind of Health Canada FDA type um, approval. And you can operate in many different modes. And so when we're thinking about manufacturing, um, changing things at the preclinical stage with either the media or the bioreactor or different kinds of cell processes is relatively low impact. But if you do all your preclinical and phase one work growing cells in a dish or in flasks and then try to switch to bioreactors, um, you're going to find a large cost um, type thing. So this is basically the sales pitch to think about manufacturing early and think about not just manufacturing for 10 mice or five pigs in a study or, uh, you know, a first in man trial of 10 or 20 people, but think about 50,000 patients down the road and how you might, uh, you might want to think about using the same process for all of those. And so that involved in me means thinking about bioreactors and bioprocessing early. So manufacturing development along with clinical, along with commercial. And so when I think about uh, manufacturing as a chemical engineer, um, I envision a process with some upstream elements, uh, where the cells come from, um, different purity and things like that. The expansion phase, which is what our lab focuses on, and I'll talk about the right here. And then downstream purification type things that happen. Uh, or, or formulation type things that happen to get your product. Um, so when you think about uh, bioreactors, there are a number of things that we can control in that environment. So oxygen, pH, the agitation rate, temperature, uh, other things like that. So we can set up systems and can control methods to make sure that the environment in there is consistent as possible. There are also a number of different cell growth formats. So single cells, not a lot of our cells grow as single cells. A lot of them grow as aggregates. So these are naturally forming aggregates in the bioreactor. We don't do a lot to them. Um, you can also grow cells of microcarriers. I've got some pictures of those a little bit later. So these are little beads that you suspend in the bioreactor to get a growth surface or in materials like a hydrogel. Um, obviously there are a number of different scales. Our lab works more at the bottom scale here. So we have a 10 mil bioreactor. We have 0.1, we have um, 500 mils. And then looking at geometries, there are a number of different geometries, which I'm going to go into in a, in a couple of slides. So when we get a, a project that we initiate, we have, to, we have to know a lot about the cells. So we have to know about the cell characteristics, whether we're going with autologous or allogeneic, because that directs us on one of those two pathways. We have to know how many cells we're starting with. We have to know how they grow, how fast they grow. Um, and then we have to know a little bit about what the cells need. So the metabolism of the cells is something that's uh, becoming very important for us to understand what type of signaling is required to maintain the phenotype or if we want to differentiate to actually cause differentiation. Um, do they need some insoluble signals like extracellular matrix? And does that actually uh, influence how, what kind of a process we design? Um, we're learning more about mechanical signals so that the, sh the shear environment within the bioreactor actually influences some of the genes and it turns on some of the pluripotency switches in our pluripotent stem cells. And that's important to understand as well when we're trying to either grow lots of pluripotent stem cells or try to differentiate them and turn those genes off. 
Um, and all of those come down to what we can do with the bioreactor design. So uh, what kind of uh, flow rates and operating conditions, pH, oxygen, et cetera. So I got two quick background slides and then we'll kind of get into it a bit more. So the static systems that a lot of people still use, uh, basically a dish or a tea flask or kind of a stack plate. And I've got a picture there showing you can get lots and lots of levels and fairly higher density. Um, if you look at the number of cells, maybe a million to 10, to 10 million cells per milliliter, um, you're only using about half a percent or maybe 1% of the volume of the bioreactor uh, with cells. So from a, an engineering point of view, that's a very low, low efficiency, right? Um, and most of these operate in kind of batch mode. Think of that as a tank if you're a chemical engineer. Whereas if we look at dynamic systems, which is what our bioreactors are, there are two main categories that we've, we've, uh, we can look at. So mechanically driven, including like a stirred suspension bioreactor, and we're going to look at those. That's why it's got the nice gold star. Uh, they're rotating, rotating bed bioreactors, basically turn the whole vessel on its side and rotate it, which we, I'm not going to talk about today. Um, the wave bioreactor is basically a bag on a shaker that provides a low shear environment and, and well mixed. And then there's the vertical wheel bioreactor from PBS, which is the other one we're going to look at today. The hydraulic systems are more perfusion, so closely more mimicking what you would find in the body with your blood system going around. Um, it include parallel plate, uh, hollow fibers where the cells either grow on the inside the fibers or outside. And then a fixed bed bioreactor where you pack a bunch of carriers together and the cells would grow in the spaces between those. Um, but the ones we're gonna focus on here are dynamic stirred suspension and dynamic vertical wheel bioreactors. So the first uh, topic is just looking at how we grow um, most embryonic stem cells in our stirred suspension bioreactors. So these are the horizontal blade. And uh, I guess maybe for this audience, I don't need too much about embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, but basically the main characteristic of these cells is that they have a large capacity to self-renew and, um, and unlimited proliferation potential. Um, and they can also contribute to all cell lineages and form cells from all three layers of the blastocyst. So embryonic stem cells are derived from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst put into culture and they can grow and then you can differentiate them into the, these cell types and many others. Induced pluripotent stem cells um, look like embryonic stem cells, but you derive them from a somatic cell, like a skin cell, a fibroblast or something. Um, put certain genes in to turn them into an induced pluripotent stem cell that then can behave very similar to an embryonic stem cell, but without the moral and ethical um, kind of uh, criteria that you would have for an embryonic stem cell. So most of the pluripotent stem cell work now is focusing on deriving cells from uh, somatic cells. So reduced ethical issues, uh, hopefully reduced rejection because you, you're generating cells from one patient for themselves. But again, there are problems and challenges with first the conversion to iPS cell and then growing them, which is what we're going to talk about. So when we grow cells in our um, dishes, and I know the pictures are a little hard to see here, even on my screen, I should have blown these up. Uh, they grow as a monolayer or small colonies in, in an adherent dish in static culture. So that's 2D culture. When we put them into suspension culture, they grow as these spherical aggregates or spheroids. So maybe 100, 200 diameter, microns in diameter. And when we grow them on microcarriers, they will grow on the surface here. So I call that 2.5D because the cells are still attached to a surface and spreading out like they would in 2D but they're exposed to shear forces and mixing like they would be in, in 3D. And so going from a dish to any of these forms, you're adding forces to the cells, you're changing the 3D um, arrangement of the cells, you're changing oxygen mass transfer, for example, but you're also changing the scalability and ability to grow up the cells better. So when we grow them in those bioreactors, we think we have to think about the forces that are on the cells. And so, um, when you stir with an impeller, you can imagine that you're putting energy into the liquid through the movement of that impeller, through that stirring motion. Um, and that motion is transferred from the impeller to the fluid and eventually to smaller and smaller um, movements of the fluid um, called turbulent eddies. And the very smallest scale where the energy dissipation happens is the Kolmogorov eddy scale. And the reason we care about that is when you can, you can calculate the size of that eddy based on how fast you're stirring. So this is just a simple calculation for a spinner flask. Um, and say this is a cluster of cells or cells on microcarriers. If you get large eddies, then an aggregate or a microcarrier can go inside and it's not really damaged that much. 
Um, and if you get them about the same order of magnitude, uh, you're going to not see too many damaging effects. But when you start seeing um, smaller eddies and larger particles, that's when you start getting cells ripped off the surface of particles or uh, aggregates getting ripped apart and you've got some damaging effects happening. So this is just one example of how fluid forces would interact with the cells, aggregates, or microcarriers in bioreactors. Another thing that we have to think about is oxygen. So if we look at the table here, if you've got a tea flask, you've got a very thin layer of media in there. So there's a large surface area to volume ratio to deliver oxygen from the gas phase to the liquid. Uh, we can calculate a mass transfer coefficient and a theoretical maximum number of cells. If we go to a small bioreactor, but we don't agitate, so we got a 100 ml bioreactor and it stops agitating, you can see the surface area to volume ratio is much smaller. So you've got a large volume here, but not a lot of area for mass transfer. And your, your mass transfer coefficient of oxygen is way lower. So all of a sudden you're gonna have real problems with limiting oxygen. If we agitate and we could change the speed, depending on the speed, you can get more and more at mass transfer of oxygen into uh, the liquid phase. And so increasing speed, good for oxygen, but increasing speed, bad for shear. So if you go to a few hundred RPM, you're gonna make a blender and have beautiful oxygen and shredded cells. So there's always a balance between supplying enough oxygen through the headspace and um, supplying enough shear or not too much shear so that you're killing all your cells. And so when we're talking about oxygen and shear, we're talking about changing geometries. Um, we're combining that with scaling up in volume. So we're going from a, a static dish to say a small 10 milliliter bioreactor to maybe 100 or 200 milliliters, 500 up to a few liters. Um, this scale up process is not a linear process. You can't just double everything and magically it works. Um, there are a lot of ratios of say tank diameter to impeller diameter, the height of liquid to uh, the diameter. Um, and so we can do calculations here, for example, of the, the maximum shear stress at the tip of the impeller. Um, and depending on your vessel, you're gonna get different correlations versus, versus agitation rate. This gray window is basically the happy region of the cells. Um, if you're too low, then the cells are all going to settle. If you're too high, you're, again, shredding the cells. So the simple calculation is not enough to really be able to scale up because if you do keep the shear constant, you're going to sacrifice the oxygen. It's not going to be staying, staying constant. So we have to do a little bit more than that. So what we like to do um, is computational fluid dynamic modeling. And so the goal here, if you look at this complicated, is the green box here. We want happy, healthy cells. We want the biology. But that biology of the cells and happy stem cells or happy differentiating cells is influenced by the aggregates. A lot of our cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells, grow as aggregates. So how big they are and the health of the aggregate. Um, and both the biology and the, the aggregate is influenced by the shear. And the only way we can really predict the shear throughout the volume of the reactor is doing this modeling. And so the modeling will enable us to design new bioreactors and, and, and really examine the conditions. It also enables us to scale up. And what we've shown, or I'll show you soon, is that we can now do experiments in this very small scale and predict what the operating conditions should be in the larger scale based on the modeling that we're doing and which variables we want to keep constant. So it's become a really great tool in our lab for um, doing studies at a small scale, which enables you to do a lot more experiments, um, and then predicting what's going to happen at the big scale. And so this is just some pictures of kind of the workflow and what some of the modeling looks like. So this is just a, a simple spinner flask. So we build the geometry in the model. Uh, we're only modeling the fluid. So basically you don't need the whole rest of the bioreactor. This is just the liquid part. And you can see there's a gap in there for the impeller. Um, you break it up into hundreds of thousands of little elements. And then you're basically solving, you know, mass and energy balance equations on those elements um, in discrete time steps and you get out pressures, velocities, shear rates, energy dissipation. So uh, these are two of our bioreactors. This is a little small one. We could take a horizontal slice. Here's a bigger one. We could take a slice. And if we look down at those slices, the small bioreactor at 40 RPM, and this is velocity here. So low velocity is blue. I don't know why they do the scale backwards here. High velocity is red, but it's on the left. Um, so you can see lots of blue at a low velocity in the small bioreactor. Increase the velocity and we get more shear, um, sorry, higher velocities near the impeller. And whenever you see a gradient of colors there, that's where you're going to see shear forces on the cells. Uh, the 100 mil bioreactor, again, a lot of the bioreactors, very low shear environment. Um, but if you go to 100 RPM, 
there's a lot more shear happening. So all of this, you can't just say, well, the small one works at 40 and 100. It's going to do the same thing at 40 and 100 on the big scale. Um, it's not going to happen. And if you go to the larger ones, the really big ones, um, these have different probes in them for temperature and pH and media addition and things like that. You get all sorts of more complex um, patterns happening in there. And so I'm um, just going to show you a little bit about how we took this and, and tested it out for growing our um, murine embryonic stem cells. And the idea here was to look at, can we determine the best conditions at the 10 milliliter scale and then use that to predict what the best conditions would be at the next scale up at the 100 mil scale and see would that work and which variable is best for that prediction. So the first is experimentally determine the optimal 10 milliliter agitation rate. So we grew our cells at 100, 120, and 140. Um, these are the kind of the clusters or aggregates. You can see they're getting quite big at the 100 RPM. Uh, 140 RPM, we're getting nice sizes. Basically anything above 300 microns, you're probably gonna have limitations of oxygen transport to cells um, in the middle of the aggregates. So. Here's cell density. Again, the 140 RPM showed the highest cell density, showed the nicest aggregates. So that's the one we picked as our optimal condition. And now based on that, we want to predict what's happening at the bigger scale. So a uh, little complicated, but basically if you look at the legend here, these are all different ways to scale up. Uh, so you can keep the power input um, constant, you can keep the impeller tip speed constant, or you can keep the shear stress, you can keep the Reynolds number, etc. So these are basically the ones at the dotted line are kind of hand calculations based on the tip of the impeller. So it's a, a single location. And then for from our CFD model, we can get volume average velocity, energy dissipation, or shear rate. And so we, depending on which of those we use, say we got a, this is the, the agitation rate at the small scale, so we found 140 is the best. If I keep the Reynolds number constant, it predicts that I should operate at 35 RPM at the big bioreactor. So that's what the y-axis is here. And if I keep, say, the volume average velocity constant, I'm around 60 RPM. And if I keep the volume average shear rate constant, I'm at 124. So this is a wide range in kind of what uh, suggested velocity um, agitation rate should be at the larger scale. So we picked a few of these and then did experiments to see which one would best predict the performance. And so we picked keeping impeller tip speed constant, the energy dissipation, maximum shear stress, and volume average shear rate. And so by keeping those constant, we calculated that we should operate at 70, 92, 101, and 124. Here are just some pictures of the aggregates. Um, and as you can see, keeping the tip speed constant gave us really large aggregates. We didn't like that at all. And if you go to the distribution here, this is the aggregate size distribution and frequency. The ideal one is a nice narrow distribution at a low, at a low size. Um, that's our baseline, the black line here. We wanna get as close as possible to the black. Um, the purple, which is this one over here, lots of different larger aggregates. Um, the other ones, not so bad. If you look at the actual average diameter though, and again, the black line is from our small scale, you can see that these two here, the orange and the um, green, gave us the best um, kind of condition, uh, aggregate sizes, the most similar to the small bioreactors. And so we could use the volume average energy dissipation rate is what we've picked to use as our scale up parameter. Um, the maximum shear stress did give the similar number, but again, this is a case where we don't have those probes and everything in there. As soon as you start adding that to scale up, um, it's not gonna work as well. So we, we like the CFD energy dissipation rate. So now we have a method where we can use energy dissipation as a scaling parameter. Um, the next thing we looked at is uh, trying to investigate different kinds of bioreactors to give different um, performance. And the first, the one we looked at and stuck with uh, is the vertical wheel bioreactors. So I showed you this before, kind of going from static to bioreactor. Um, this is the vertical wheel reactor. So this is a hundred milliliter spinner flask here. And this is also a hundred milliliter vertical wheel bioreactor. Uh, so there's a little stand where you can um, adjust the RPM. There are little lights in here so you can see what's going on. And this is basically a, a paddle wheel type thing that rotates in here, um, kind of sweeping the, the fluid down and pushing it up uh, here. And I got a video a little bit later. So the selling point of these was the low shear forces, um, very good aeration and scalable. So they have sizes all the way up to 500 liters 
which I, I don't think we're going to run in our lab unless I no, want to have no grad students for a few years, then I could probably pay for the media to go into a 500 liter bioreactor. So the ones we play with are, are kind of the 0 0.1 liter, 0 0.5, and we just got a, a three liter loner system in to, to play with in the lab and, and do some experiments, which is really cool because that's all controlled now, process controlled. The other ones go in the incubator. And so our modeling, just like we did before, we would model the geometry, we would mesh that into our elements, um, apply the boundary conditions and then solve and, and get our, our uh, distributions of velocity and shear and everything else. Um, so this is uh, these are some views from the top down, looking at the, the impeller in the 0.1 liter. Um, you can see different fluid velocities. Again, the blue is low velocity, the red is higher velocity. And the top is at 40 RPM, the bottom's at 100 RPM. So a lot higher velocities at 100 RPM. Um, and here also you can see the um, the kind of, uh, I'm forgetting the word right is now, figure eight type fluid pattern. There's a better word for it, where you're drawing the fluid down into the impeller here and it gets put up and kind of goes in a figure eight type pattern where nice low velocities for a large volume of the reactor. Um, here are just showing some of the same parameters that we showed before. Um, so again, the top row is at 40 RPM, the bottom row is at 100. And we're looking at velocity here on the left. So again, a low agitation, the velocity is fairly even and, and quite low throughout the volume. Shear stress, again, the same type of thing. You're, you're seeing some high shear stress right near the impeller, but it's very localized. And then the energy dissipation is very low and very even throughout the bioreactor, right down at the bottom of the scale. And if we increase the agitation, now we see a really, really high velocities here and we don't really operate too much in this area anymore. Um, and then again, higher shear stresses near the impeller and higher energy dissipation rates. So we went, wanted to do kind of a head-to-head -head comparison of these two systems. And so we were looking at a horizontal blade bioreactor, uh, just one shown here, for example, and then the vertical wheel. Um, and we looked at three different elements here. So a lot of the induced pluripotent embryonic stem cells need aggregate formation, uh, the initial stages. And so we looked at preforming aggregates and some different parameters there of how large those preformed aggregates were versus single cells. Then we looked at different agitation rates in the, um, in the bioreactors here, looked a little bit at oxygen and media feeding. And then we took the best protocols from these first two stages and we did serial passaging. So the, the idea is that if the protocol really works and we're growing induced pluripotent stem cells, then we're gonna be um, keeping the phenotype of the cells. We're not gonna be generating weird karyotypes and they're still gonna retain their differentiation ability. Um, so this is the aggregate preformation stage. So here we took single cells, we put them in non-adherent culture plates with a little bit of media and, media and rock inhibitor. And we chose through, we picked three different cell densities to generate the aggregates and four different time points. Um, the ones with the colored boxes are the ones that we kind of picked that were just uh, just to show some variability to take further and put into the bioreactor. So we took two hour aggregates, started with a low cell density. So these are going to be nice and small, a little bit bigger at four hours. And then we took larger aggregates and inoculated them, seeded them into a bioreactor and grew them for six days. And you can see that the yellow here is significantly higher than all three others. So longer time point, more cells bigger aggregates, healthier start to the culture. Um, by day five, lots of nice healthy aggregates here as well, uh, but not too big. The scale bar is 200 there, so we're not too worried about necrosis. The second stage is looking at, okay, the different agitation rates. So we looked at 40, 60, and 80 RPM. Uh, we didn't really get a significant change in the cell density um, and uh, getting a multiplication of between 10 and 12 or 10 and 13 there. Um, and the aggregate size distribution, a little bit better at 80. So this is the red line here um, in that we get a narrower distribution. So really, I want all the cells to be the same in the bioreactor. So the narrowest distribution at a nice low, uh, low number. So this is the red one here. Uh, we also looked at oxygen and nutrients and the nutrients being a simple just fed batch versus batch culture. So in this graph, which is viable cells over time, the solid lines are going to be the batch culture and the dashed lines are when we feed. So we take a 50% media exchange on day four. And then the dotted lines are um, 
the uh, hypoxic, or let me say the red is hypoxic and the blue is normoxic. So comparing the two solid lines here, the normoxic ones did perform better, although it wasn't a st statistically significant. Um, when we looked at the dashed lines, the blue versus the red, we definitely saw that normoxic and fed batch performed the best. So these cells do need oxygen and they um, do uh, like it when you have a, a media feeding. And so our expansion ratio that we got in six days was 32 fold, which was significantly higher than a lot of the other studies at the time that we, that we did this. So then we took it to serial passaging. So preform our aggregates and expand for six to eight days, dissociate, preform mini aggregates, repeat three times. And so each color here is just a different passage so you can show them apart. Um, high viabilities throughout the cultures, very reproducible growth rates and expansion ratios. Um, lots of nice healthy aggregates at the end of each of our cultures. So this is at the passaging day of each. Um, we got a cumulative multiplication ratio of over 1 million. So for every cell we put in, we got a million out. Um, and so we can get really, really large cell numbers in just a short period of time with these. Um, so that, that we were very happy to see that, that we're getting reproducible growth and not decreasing over time, which happens when you serial passage and things aren't going well. Um, and the cells were still happy and normal. So we looked at SSCA4, trial 160, Nanog, um, saw all the markers. We also, in collaboration with the Krawitz lab here at UFC, did um, teratoma formation. So we'll place some of the, the cells just under the skin uh, of mice and let them spontaneously grow uh, for a few weeks and then uh, excise the tumors. And if they contain uh, representative cell types of all the three germ layers, then you are sure you have a, 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 a pluripotent cell type. So it's kind of the gold standard of, of um, testing that. And so we did see evidence of endoderm, ectoderm and mesoderm in the same uh, teratomas that formed. So again, very happy that that works because often it doesn't. <laughs> So here's a little video showing, I knew I had it on one of the slides here, just showing the vertical wheel bioreactor moving and you can see the aggregates. Hopefully you can see little, little dots moving around there. Those are induced pluripotent stem cell aggregates. And so again, we used a novel bioreactor, um, achieved a really nice expansion of cells and I was really happy that the cells were the same as what we started with. Um, and starting with say 2 million cells, you could get two times 10 to the 12th cells at the end of that fourth passage, which has really made us happy. So the last thing we wanted to look at is um, removing some of the, the bioprocessing bottlenecks. So there's still some steps in there that aren't uh, optimal. And so the things that we looked at after growing the cells in static first from frozen is um, looking at the inoculation phase. So we did a little bit more comparing single cell to preformed aggregates, because ideally we'd like to just throw the cells into the bioreactor without that preforming stage. Uh, we looked at a little bit more at the media change and then how we harvest the cells. Because all the graphs I've shown you, there we take a sample and we dissociate it and we can um, determine the cell number, uh, taking 500 mils or 100 mils of cell suspension and getting all of the cells out of that um, in a healthy way is a little bit more challenging. So the first experiment, I'm gonna have a little cartoon in the corner because the graphs, the slides are gonna look very similar, but we're looking at different things. So this was comparing um, single cells inoculated into the vertical wheel and our standard spinner flask bioreactors. Um, and again, we use three different agitation rates. The solid lines here, the PBS is the vertical wheel and the dashed lines, the NDS is the horizontal blade, our spinner flask. Um, so in all cases, the, the vertical wheel bioreactor outperformed in terms of cell growth. If you look at the um, aggregate size distribution, again, we're getting a nice narrow distribution of aggregate sizes at all the agitation rates actually. Um, horizontal, we get a little bit more variability in terms of the um, uh, aggregate size distribution. And I think the design of our horizontal blade is such that we're getting um, radial mixing, but we're not getting a lot of axial mixing. Whereas the vertical wheel, because of the, the way that the blade is oriented or the blades, um, you're really getting all the volume of the bioreactor is getting mixed through those impellers, uh, controlling the aggregate size. Um, and so you can see that when you look at the uh, some pictures also, you're getting these giant aggregates. So there's going to be some dead cells in the middle of that for sure. When I see that, I, I'm not happy. 
Uh, here, I'm very happy. Nice low, low, little aggregates, uh, healthy cells, very nice. So single cell expansion did not really work in the horizontal blade, but we did see some su success in the vertical wheel. So we wanted to compare that now head to head of single cell and this preformed aggregates in the vertical wheel. Um, Again, SC is the single cell inoculum. Those are the solid lines here, the single cell. The dashed lines are the preformed. Um, the colors correspond to RPM. And so for each of them, um, in at least in the high, at the low agitation rate, the single cell performed better. Um, but in the other agitation rates, the, um, the preformed aggregates did a bit better. And here you can look at the aggregate size distribution um, again, starting out you're getting nice narrow distributions but they are growing over time so at a very low agitation rate the single cell expansion seemed to be the best um, of all of them so sticking with single cell is an easier inoculation procedure and um, faster to kind of start your cultures and passage so we wanted to see if we could do that um, and we basically got higher expansion than the preformed aggregates so we're sticking we were stick, sticking from here on with the single cell the next thing we wanted to look at is uh, fed batch. So all of the cultures before, you basically put the media on the first day and six or eight days later, uh, see what you have. In terms of cell number, here we wanted to feed on day four and see if that would boost what was uh, happening in the culture. So every time you see a yellow arrow here, it's a media exchange. Um, again, the solid lines are the batch culture. The dashed lines are fed batch. Um, fed batch, you can see by the end here, greatly outperformed the batch cultures in all cases. Um, you didn't get too large aggregates unless you're looking at the really low RPM. Uh, there were the averages around 300, um, but we got significantly higher cell densities uh, at all agitation rates. And the, ag the aggregate diameters were still um, at least at the higher agitation rates uh, within the ranges that we like to see. So once we've got a bunch of healthy aggregates, we're on day six, you have to dissociate. And a lot of times the protocol is removed from the bioreactor, you're dissociating in centrifuge tubes, and then you have to um, uh, centrifuge or dilute the enzyme. So the ideal procedure would be one we could do inside the bioreactor. And so that's what we were trying here, trying to dissociate within the bioreactor by simply adding an enzyme and then deactivating it after. And so this is the percent of cells that remained in aggregate form after different time. Um, and these are three different enzymes that we looked at. Um, this is the dissociation efficiency measured at the end uh, of 20 minutes of each of the different enzymes. So you can see the, the purple line there is, is 0.05% trypsin. And they've got triple E and acutase. Um, the acutase performed the best. And here are just some pictures showing after 15, 20 minutes a uh, nice single cell suspension um, with the acutase. And when we replated those cells um, in static culture to see if they still grew normally, um, form nice colonies and seem to grow um, the same way as, as the cells did before even being in the bioreactor. Um, so we did add rock inhibitor and we did add acutase. Um, we got about 95% of the aggregates dissociating in the bioreactor. And then you can harvest uh, the single cells and separate them. So then we took our combined process using single cell inoculation and the harvesting in the reactor and did a serial passage, just two passages this time. So we inoculated the first bioreactor, the 100 mil size, this one here. We grew the cells fed batch on day four. And at the end here, we harvested and then re-inoculated both the small one, the darker purple there or blue, I'm a little colorblind, and then the larger 0.5 liter. Um, and we saw very reproducible growth in both those scales. So our protocol is scaling nicely. We're not seeing a difference. And we also saw nice aggregate sizes, um, not too large, about 200, 220 microns at maximum at both of the scales. And so we don't really have enough uh, media to kind of go to the three liter. We didn't have the three liter bioreactor. We would be trying that after. But the idea would be if we could inoculate a 0.1, grow the cells, inoculate a 0.5, grow them, and then inoculate the, the larger scale. Um, we also checked at the end of that combined process uh, that our pluripotency markers were there. So the same we tried before, we looked at karyotyping um, to make sure we weren't uh, changing anything in the cells. And we looked at directed differentiation to the three different lineages and found that we could still generate cells representative of the three different germ layers. We looked at neural, 
liver and heart um, cell different direct to differentiation protocols. And the very last thing that I'll sh I'll share um, before talking a little bit about Calgary is that we're we've just started to look at why why the cells love the bioreactor, and we're working with Derek Rancourt's lab also at the U of C. Um, and here we were looking at culturing. We started again with mouse ES cells, which are easier to grow, um, pre-culturing them with LIF in the bioreactor or uh, in static, and then we grow them, exposing them to shear in the bioreactor. So this is a 3D exposure to shear or to shear on a parallel plate type apparatus. So this is 2D exposure to shear to try to tease out the effects of geometry um, and looked at different, um, different markers and different mechanisms to see why the cells remain pluripotent in the bioreactor. Um, and one of the things that this study pointed to is beta catenin and vinculin. And so we're trying to investigate now if we can look at different um, media additives to kind of either block that if we want to differentiate the cells or um, add something that's uh, cheaper than some of the ingredients that are in there now to make a more efficient cell culture media. So that's kind of ongoing work. So the, the summary of the research part here is bioreactors are awesome. And um, it's very, it's complex to move into uh, 3D and suspension culture, but it's important to do it early. Um, we still don't know everything that's happening in there and the effects of these, these conditions on the cells. And we need some, we need simulation and modeling as a good tool. Um, and I think we've, I've really started to like these vertical wheel bioreactors um, as a, a really nice system to enable large growth of cells without having um, huge shear forces on them and, and very reproducible. And so I think the translation piece, because I know the ser seminar series is translational biomedical engineering and I didn't talk about that, uh, is really translating some basic NSERC and Alberta Innovates uh, discovery type research um, into a, a partnership with a company. And so it started with an internship student who we sent down to California with a MyTax scholarship. Um, she stayed there. It's, I think it was a four month internship and it'll probably be a year and a half. We've got a deal where she's finishing her thesis down there or so she tells me. Um, it turned into some research contracts with the company, which has been really great. And then a whole bunch of other contracts. So. I think this mechanism of starting out with a you know an internship student or a small project and seeing how it goes and then you can turn that into into something big um, and so hopefully some of these will start translating into um, protocols that others are using uh, with these bioreactors and so i'm going to give a shout out to the real heroes of this <laughs> all these slides and the data that was generated uh, so tiffany and brianna is the internship student down at pbs biotech a number of others in the lab, Aaron and Tanya, and then before COVID, we actually used to get in the lab. This is them all waiting for me to show up for the lab meeting. <laughs> they sent me this picture on our group chat, and I'm like, yeah, I know I'm late. Um, we have a, a bioengineering buddies Instagram, so they, they have an Instagram account, um, and generous funding, great partnership with PBS Biotech. They've been absolutely fantastic. Um, we're doing some more modeling on their bioreactors, so hopefully I'll be able to share that next time. Uh, innovates and, and my tax. And I'm going to give you two, two or three slides about UFC as a shameless plug for our university. <laughs> so we've just got CFI funding for a Center for Cell Therapy Translation. So we're building a, a large, a place to do large animal regenerative medicine studies. So the University of Calgary has a faculty of veterinary medicine and they have a spy hill facility out, out on a farm. Um, and they have great, we're going to do large animal transplantation studies out there. So if you need to do pig work or anything like that, we're gonna have a bioreactor suite there for expanding cells. And then we've um, bought some infrastructure for real quality control of, of the cells going in and the cells coming out um, to precisely measure. Um, and the UFC has also just recently partnered with CCRM to kind of enable some of these discoveries that are coming out to rapidly translate into either companies or licensing or things like that. So we've just got the CFI funding. We haven't built it yet, but we're very excited to be kind of moving in this direction, a translation direction of our research. Um, and this is just part of what's um, happening at the University of Calgary. So uh, most had mentioned uh, in the introduction that I also lead the research initiative in biomedical engineering. So we do a lot of work in human mobility and biomechanics, imaging, regenerative medicine, obviously the area I work in, uh, a, a lot of work in the diagnostics, precision biodiagnostics, 
Uh, we have a create training program in wearables here as well. And then everything else that didn't fit in that bucket, there's lots of cool other, other things happening as well. Um, and what we've done is really built a network of researchers across campus from uh, almost every faculty. We've got the big six, which are my six deans that I report to, uh, engineering, medicine, kinesiology, science, nursing, and veterinary medicine. And this is just a diagram showing how all the researchers are connected across those faculties, which I, I like to show because it took me a long time to connect the data, collect the data. <laughs> and you can see, uh, I can see Amir on here, Mohsen. There's Amir connected to everybody. Uh, he's a busy guy. Uh, there's me connected to a few people here. Um, but really multidisciplinary teams, anybody wants to do anything fun and collaborative, uh, give me a contact. You can see we got arts, business, nursing. It's really fun. And Mosin also mentioned our, our new BME bachelor's degree. So anybody watching that wants to go into a new biomedical and undergrad degree, uh, let me know or go to our website. Um, I talked a little bit about the research that we're doing in those six core areas. And we've had a grad program now, and I can't believe it, for 25 years in biomedical engineering. Um, and I've been at the university for almost that long. So final slide. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to hear rants about things or <laughs> learn about biomedical engineering uh follow the lab on instagram and that's the uh the alberta view so happy to answer any questions and thanks again for the uh, the invite thank you so much dr carlos uh, for this amazing uh talk and uh, i really enjoyed and you brought me back to maybe 20 years ago when I was uh, doing chemical engineering and doing this, all these calculation in uh, bioreactors, in players and this stuff. So, but I mean, uh, I can, I can still say that I remember uh, lots of stuff. That's good. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is very amazing. And, uh, you know, but uh, one question that I have, I'm kind of uh, outsider from, uh, you know, cell manufacturing, but I would like to know uh, the downstream. You talk a little bit about downstream, uh, about purification, preservation of the cells after, you know, maybe a storage or cryopreservation or these kind of things. Uh, was there any effort on, on these uh, kind of, you know, downstream processes in your research group or uh, in, in, in the companies that you're working with? So um, our group hasn't done a lot on that. And again, the, the, the work I showed today was growing IPS cells mostly to get lots of those cells. And you would never want to transplant IPS cells. You'd want to turn them into something else and get rid of all the IPS cells. Exactly. And so there are, um, there are other groups that are working more on the, on the downstream aspects. Um, we just haven't really gotten into that as much. I think uh, there are also groups that are working on, um, for example, suicide genes inside uh, pluripotent cells so that you can differentiate and then you add a factor. And if there are any pluripotent cells in, it's only going to kill those cells. Um, and that way you can be sure to get rid of them because obviously it's something with these type of cells we're really concerned about is the tumor formation um, from any kind of remnant iPS cells. So I, I totally agree that that's a very important issue, but it isn't something that we have looked at um, per se. But it, we're, we're trying to get into more um, actually generating specific cell types. So we've, we've done work with these bioreactors on uh, mesenchymal stem cells as well. So we have a project on equine cells with Guelph, um, and they're trying to use the cells for kind of tissue engineering for horses. Um, and then we've used the, the, ver the horizontal blade for skin-derived cells, um, trying to differentiate those as well. But yeah, not as much purification, but it's a huge part of it, for sure. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Sam here. Uh, at, uh, he, he thanks you uh, for, for your presentation. And he's asking, are the single use of PBS reactor uh, using BAC? Uh, at every uh, scale, or are the vessel rigid and in either uh, event, how does one avoid throwing uh, away the insular? Uh, one wonders about the waste generated and associated expense, if anything more than just the bag is single use. So he's just asking about, yeah, the bag. Yeah, yeah so they, the, the bioreactors are technically single use. 
uh, but we use them a few more times. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, it just, it's not like, not like a tea flask. So you can, you can kind of um, use them again, these types of bioreactors, not a lot of times. Uh, they're designed though, if you were going to go into a, you know, an actual production method, you would use, you would have single use um, for the smaller ones. The larger ones, I believe have a, a lining uh, or a bag that kind of goes inside with the, with the impeller and then everything else is kind of like the probes and the infrastructure around that. Um, but I, I totally agree about the waste in terms of um, when I think of my chemical engineering colleagues who are doing sustainability and environmental and life cycle analysis. And uh, I think of how much plastic we throw out in one day in our lab with pipettes and flasks. And um, yeah, it's kind of, it's on my mind, but uh, we, honestly, that's the world we live in now. It's, it's much harder to re-sterilize a glass vessel and prove that you've really got it sterile and clean than it is to kind of have a new plastic one and um until we get a really good recycling method for these uh that's the way it has to be so yeah it pains me too but that's the world we live in thank you so much uh megon, megon is asking about how easy is a small bioreactor system to set up thinking about tissue engineering and cell expansion for bioprinting or biofabrication, would a bioreactor system help to maintain phenotypic stability of primary human cells compared to a static monolayer culture? So the ease of setup, so the, the mini bioreactors, the 0.1 and the, yeah. the 0.5 go in an incubator, just like a spinner flask would go in. And so they each have their own stand though for the vertical wheel. And so they just plug in and they, the incubator controls the temperature and the, the oxygen and the air and the humidity. Um, so very easy to set up. The larger ones, the three liter one that we're doing right now, it's a, it's a bit of work to set that one up and get going. Um, so luckily we have really great, uh, you have the student down there who we video chat with to set up <laughs> everything. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Uh, oh, the human cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The phenotypic stability of uh, primary human cells compared to a static monolayer culture. Are they so different? That, that's something I think you would need to investigate on a cell by cell basis because mm -hmm. um, it's not easy to grow every cell type in suspension. Um, and so we've worked hard to kind of be able to grow the iPS cells and say human ES cells and human MSCs. Um, but the, there are other forces and other geometries at work. And so I think if you're just starting with the human primary cell line, we would need to do some studies to, to really see um, what the effect of those changing conditions had on the cells. So I wouldn't sell this as a, a better way to kind of maintain a bank of primary human cells, because really what you're trying to do is get the cells to do something they don't normally do when we want to grow 10 to the 12 cells. That's not something your body does normally in the in you know in a month. So we're putting them in an environment that, in when you really think about it, is not maintaining what they normally do in the body. But the iPS cells are an artificial construct of the lab anyway. So my my short answer is probably not for maintaining uh, you know um, primary cell lines. But I'm not saying it's out of the question. If you have a specific cell type you want to play with, then maybe you can send me an email. We're happy to play with new cells. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Megan. You can uh, contact Dr. Collins, uh, so ask your question offline. So, Mohsen, uh, please go ahead. I see that you wrote many questions on the paper. Using, <laughs> I saw. Uh, I'm taking notes too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, Mike. As always, uh, uh, you have uh, you give very nice talks and very very informative presentations i really like uh, and as i as I, I want to echo what human said was like when i saw those numerical simulations uh you know you <laughs> took me back to my undergrad uh, cfd See, courses it's useful and, it's and useful modeling and at the time you didn't think so useful. <laughs> yeah yeah but it's very nice to see those you know um uh, uh, you know, flow distributions, flow velocity fields. Uh, so along those directions, uh, uh, I noticed that you model 
you 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 model the flow and then uh, you mainly focus on the velocity distribution uh, and uh, but i was wondering if you have uh, studied the distribution of oxygen and maybe maybe uh, you know uh, byproducts of the cells within the within the media and then uh, using your numerical So we model. haven't done that yet. So we've looked at, the next thing we're looking at is, is the particles. Uh, so microcarriers yeah. and where they would go and how often they're in the high shear versus low shear. Um, we have not looked at, uh, say, the composition and, and how mixed that is. I would I would think it would be quite well mixed. We've done we had done some experiments a long time ago using just some dye and you know high speed video in the mm -hmm. horizontal blade, but I haven't I haven't repeated those in the vertical wheel mm -hmm. uh, once. But I've got some summer students starting, so yeah, maybe we'll get them to just try try a few of those things out. But yeah, I haven't actually modeled the oxygen or measured it uh, at different locations in kind of you know in the depth of those bioreactors but we also i also have a student who's looking at um kind of different uh, sensors and kind of the little just the little sticker ones i think we're getting a system in that could do that so um definitely something we'd be interested in looking at to make sure that the cells um like the bottom of the bioreactor doesn't have say lower oxygen levels or something like that and how long the cell would spend there even yeah exactly because there would be uh, from from the velocity distributions i noticed that there's there might be i i i, I forgot whether like a like a, the scale of the legends that you use but there might be areas that the velocity is uh, is too low maybe dead zones and then the cells may get stuck in those areas and then they don't receive enough oxygen probably i don't know but that's 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 uh, that could be a very interesting study. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I agree. That would be. We have seen when we do very low agitation mm -hmm. and the larger aggregates, they kind of settle at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really seen an area where they're kind of just like staying in one place yeah. and kind of yeah. moving around. But I, um, yeah, that'd be interesting to look at. But the outcome is pretty interesting because because it, it seems that uh, there there. This is not a big problem, though. When when because you collected all of this, you get these nice cell aggregates, and then and then they're functioning properly. So it seems that it's not a big problem. But maybe just uh, that that was a question that I had in my mind uh, when you showed the velocity distributions. It's it's a very interesting combination of experiment and, and numerical studies, which is always I think I encourage my students to always consider that in their analysis. This is this is. Uh, yeah, we've just started to model their 80 liter. Yeah. And I would love to get some experiments there. It would obviously have to be done at PBS because we couldn't afford it, but um, just to look at what's actually happening inside, because that's where you really maybe see yeah. um, some dead zones if on a yeah. larger scale like that. Yeah. Um, but the modeling, it seems to look quite similar to the other to the other ones, which is really yeah. nice. Um, but again, that that's a lot harder to do experiments. <laughs> I agree. I agree, especially with all these uh, expensive media and uh, yes, oh my goodness, <laughs> so that's just and stem cell media. Like this is crazy. <laughs> Why don't I pick a cell that grows like a weed and just email? <laughs> uh, so uh, another question that I had was uh, about the uh, the size of uh, your aggregate. So I noticed that you have aggregate with different sizes. Uh, uh, so do you uh, do you see any uh, effect of the aggregate size this differences between the size of the aggregates on the you know on the uh, on the quality of the cells when you you know passage them multiple times so in general when we did that multiple passaging even the, the whatever range we got there the I didn't see a difference. Mm -hmm. What we haven't done is um, separate the cells, separate the aggregates mm -hmm. into kind of different fractions mm -hmm. and then only passage those fractions. So mm -hmm. just passage, say, the larger fraction and maybe middle and then everything smaller. Them. Um, we did that uh, a while ago, a long time ago, again, <laughs> with neural stem cells. And I don't think we found a difference when we were growing those, but these are very different beasts. Mm -hmm. I think even Peter Zanstra had a paper where they looked at differentiation trajectories of aggregates of different sizes. Uh, and I can't remember if he was doing cardiac or something and did show 
some different trajectories from say large aggregates versus small. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't offhand remember what large meant there and how yeah. much larger than these, but um, I, that's why we want to keep everything the same. So we're not worrying about that. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly we were looking at worrying about um, necrosis, right? And the mm -hmm. big aggregates. But that would be interesting to actually see kind of large passaging just the large aggregates mm -hmm. or even take the different fractions out and replate them in static and just see which ones kind of, mm -hmm. if they have different kind of growth rates there. Yeah, that's interesting. But the, the largest size was, I noticed that's 200 micron. Yeah, so they're not that big. They're not that big. So I think, I think, uh, it's pretty safe in terms of like you know having uh, a, a size that does not have a, you know a, a necrotic core or maybe you know uh, maybe the cells uh, uh, the majority of the cells uh, are uh, you know experiencing normoxic conditions instead of hypoxic conditions. But this is this and is that's why we do the the serial passaging too to see yeah. if there's some kind of a selection effect that we maybe. Uh -huh would be minor at one passage, but would be amplified uh -huh. when we did uh -huh. multiple times. I mean, you didn't see that too much, which yeah. was good, yeah. That makes sense. Uh, so my my other question was about the cell dissociation um, uh, media that you're using, uh, uh, the, the enzyme, sorry, that you're using. Uh, uh, so do you see, and this is again, again, this is uh, uh, out of curiosity, do you see any effect on the uh, on the function of cells after you dissociate them uh, using the uh, the enzymes? Uh, in not in not in what we measured. No, um, we didn't didn't see any kind of negative effects of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to I'm trying to remember now if the serial passaging had the enzyme in each one. I'm gonna go find the paper right now because I'm curious to remember. Um, if I guess I could stop sharing the screen now, yeah. <laughs> you can all see me browsing around on my computer. <laughs> there we go. Um, the oops, the serial. Here we go. I think. Oh, here it is. I think the serial passaging was mechanical in this one, not the. That's what I have a. Um. Oh no, we used Accutase. It was Accutase. Yep. Yeah. So we've done the four passaging with the Accutase and still saw, you know, maintenance of pluripotency markers, the differentiation, um, the directed. And then we also, I don't know if we did the teratoma for this one. Uh, oh, we did. Yeah. Teratoma formation for that one too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So no, no real effect. Okay. That's fair. So my last question, I know that you have to live in five minutes. Uh, oh, right. Yep. <laughs> so interested, and then I, I wanted to uh, get your opinion about uh, the aggregates again. Back, going back to the aggregates and shear stress. Uh, so the cell aggregates, the cells that are at the on the edge of the aggregate, they experience the shear, whereas the cells that are uh, within the aggregate, they do not experience the uh, the shear stresses. So, do you see any, any, you know, uh, effect of shear? So, so there's there's a difference between like the cells that experience shear stress and those that are in the like in the middle of the aggregate and don't experience the shear stress. Do you see that these differences have any effect on the, you know, uh, on the uh, quality of the cells that you are eventually harvesting from the system? This is a super question. So, <laughs> when uh, so again, we did work with, we started with neural stem cells. That's how our lab started working with stem cells who also grow in aggregates and did um, kind of selective dissociation yeah. where we would remove, we built a little racetrack thing and we would remove the outer layer cells and take them and do stuff and then remove the lex layer. Um, and only in really large aggregates, I think if I remember correctly, did we see anything different about the cells in the middle? This is after they've been grown in the bioreactor. Um, we also showed though that in the neural in the neural stem cells that the cells were moving in the aggregate. So they're not just on the outside. Mm. And so um, I have not, you know, had time to go look at that for the IPS cells. And for mm. example, if there is kind of a circulation of cells from inner to outer or how long that would be, what rates that would be. Um, but I think that the, 
So the cells on the outside see shear from kind of the fluid directly moving, mm -hmm. but the cells kind of one or two layers in, those cells are also, you know, relatively moving compared to the cells on the outside. So they're also seeing shear, but just in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not, I haven't, I'm not convinced that it's only the outer ones that are affected by mm -hmm. putting them in the bioreactor. But again, I have no no hard evidence to back that up, except for some of the work we've done with these pathways and everything, where we show kind of a large number of cells that that last kind of slide I showed, mm -hmm. um, paper that just came out, I think last week, um, that kind of shows a little bit more of the mechanism. So I, I agree, this is something I've been very curious about for a long time, mm -hmm. and you need the right grant and the right student yeah. <laughs> to, to answer very those questions. Very interesting too. I didn't know that the cells are moving within the aggregate as well. At least the neural ones were. The most neural stem cells were. I haven't measured it for iPS cells. Um, mm -hmm. Be very curious to do that. I think we did some labeling where we'd label cells and then um, it, it incorporates into the cell membrane. Mm -hmm. And then you, it only incorporates into those cells. And then we did something with merging different colored aggregates together. And then you can see the colors, the two colors. Yeah. Well, when you grow the cells in a two and a half D system, then you'll probably mm -hmm. expose all of the cells to the shear. And then that could, you know, uh, maybe that could be a good control. Maybe. Uh, yeah. We try to, we try to avoid two in the microcarriers because that adds another whole level. I, I was going to, I was going to present some of the equine MSC work, but the, uh, this there's a huge challenge in getting the cells to come off yeah. if you get a really good microcarrier the cells love them yeah but they love them so much that they don't want to leave <laughs> so you got to get one that's not quite so good but they stay on and then they want to leave later or yeah. dissolve it entirely which is another yeah. kind of cool thing yeah. okay okay well thank you very much uh mike i mean i mean well, thanks for the introduction the invite it was oh, very nice. thank you so much before uh mike uh i have one small question you yep. you generate lots of IPSC for a specific application, let's say uh, cardiac uh, cell therapy. I I'm just wondering, you know, down the road we have to do differentiation. Can we do differentiation also in bioreactors? That's we're looking at that right now. So we've got a we're trying to do it for. Um, oh my goodness, for the islets for diabetes. Trying to see if we can um starting to work with edmonton to, to see if we can get them to differentiate in the bioreactor so we do the whole thing in the bioreactor that's the goal great thank you so much so uh thank you so much dr kalus uh for for uh your amazing uh talk and also the time you put for q a so uh, for the audience i would like to encourage everybody to follow us and also uh, log in for the next week, Professor Annabi from UCLA Talk. Uh, everyone have a great day and uh, and see you next week, Wednesday uh, at noon Eastern time. Bye bye. Take care. Thanks again very much. Had a great time. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. I don't know how to end it. <laughs> I'll end it. Okay. Bye. Bye. Let me just end broadcast.